Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to week three of this uh, online course on OpenMP programming. So I'm going to start off today by talking a bit more about synchronization. So um, we've, we've already discussed this as a as a as a concept, uh, but so far the only ways we've seen to synchronize threads are by essentially starting and stopping parallel regions uh, and also the implied synchronization points at the end of the work sharing directives. So for example, the parallel loop directive has an implied barrier synchronization at the end where all the threads wait until all the other threads have finished their set of iterations before threads can proceed with the rest of the parallel region. So to, today I want to look at some more synchronization techniques and, uh, and how they work in OpenMP. So just a reminder of why do we need this? So we need to, to synchronize actions on shared variables because by default, threads inside a parallel region are executing the block of code asynchronously without regard for what other threads are doing. So that means that we often need uh, some mechanism to ensure the correct ordering of reads and writes to shared variables. Uh, and one particular case of this is that we need to protect updates to shared variables, which are not atomic by default. So if we have a typical kind of update action on a shared variable where a thread reads it, modifies it, and then writes it again, then we have to make sure that uh, that kind of update is only performed by one thread at a time. So I'm going to start, however, by saying a little bit more about barriers. So as I said, we've already encountered the concept of a barrier. So this is this full synchronization point between all the threads in a parallel region where no thread can proceed past a barrier until all the other threads have arrived. Okay. And so we've encountered this in a sense that there's an implicit barrier at the end of, well, parallel regions uh, and also the work sharing directives like do for sections, which I haven't talked about in this course and isn't used very much, uh, and also single, which we, which we mentioned last week. So sometimes, and though not very often, it's useful to be able to explicitly code a barrier directive. Um, this is done with the syntax you can see here. So this is one of the few OpenMP directives that doesn't have any block of code associated with it. So it's just a standalone directive that inserts a, a barrier at that point in the code. So Fortran's exclamation mark dollar OMP barrier, C or C++ hash pragma OMP barrier, say so with, with no associated code block. One thing we do have to be careful of here, and this is actually also true of the work sharing constructs as well, either all threads in the parallel region or none of them must encounter the barrier. Otherwise, that will result in deadlock. So the barrier is expecting all the threads in the parallel region to reach that point before any of them can proceed. So if we have some complex control flow, where uh, we have some, you know, we could end up in the situation where some threads never reach the barrier, then the threads that do reach it will just sit there forever. So if you have some complicated control flow, then you have to be careful that either all threads or, or none of them encounter the barrier. Okay. 
So if you remember last time uh, we talked about the master directive. Um, so this is a way of marking a piece of code inside a parallel region which is executed by thread zero only. Um, so that's one use case for a barrier because the master, unlike single, does not have an implicit barrier at the end of it. So if you do want all the other threads to wait while thread zero executes the master region, then you need to code an explicit barrier after the, after the master construct. Um, so that's one use case. Um, so here, here's another one. Um, say it's a little bit contrived. Um, it's it's difficult to find sensible use cases that fit on fit on one slide. But hey, let's let's try anyway. Okay. So what I'm imagining here is that I'm setting up a mechanism where every thread has a neighboring has the notion of a neighboring thread. So, uh, and in this case, what's, what's going to happen is that the neighboring thread is the thread with one with ID one less than the current thread. Okay, so that's what the first two lines in uh, in in the parallel region do. So, is I, I get my thread number, and then I set a private variable to be one less than my thread number. Uh, and then I'm going to, to to complete the circle. So if I'm thread zero, then my neighbor is the last thread. So every every thread has a neighboring has a neighbor thread. Then I imagine that I have some array A that I'm going to to index by my thread number. Okay. And so what's going to happen is that every thread will write a value into uh, a, the element of A corresponding to its thread number. And then at some point later in the parallel region, I want to read the value that my neighboring thread wrote. Okay. So that's what the line after the barrier does. So that reads the element of A that belongs, if you like, in some sense, to the neighboring thread. So in order for this to work correctly, I need to make sure that the read of A of my, from my neighboring thread is guaranteed to happen after the write. So I have a cross-thread dependency here. So I need to make sure that all the writes happen before any of the reads. And one natural way to do that would be to insert a barrier directive between the, the write and, and the read of A here. So that makes sure that all the writes happen before the barrier and then all the threads synchronize with the barrier so that once they reach the read, they're, they're guaranteed that all the writes have already occurred. Okay, so uh, as usual, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to type in the in the chat box, and uh, I can try to answer them as we go along. Okay, so on to the next idea, which uh, say we've covered in principle, but here here are the details of how it works. It is critical sections. So a critical section is a block of code which can be executed by only one thread at a time. So it might be executed by many different threads. Um, it might be executed many times um, and in, in any order. But the restriction here is that only one thread at a time can be executing it. Uh, and this is exactly the kind of construct that we need to be able to protect updates to shared variables. So the syntax is, uh, again, uh, unsurprising. Um, Fortran 
exclamation mark dot p critical, uh, followed by the block of code that comprises the critical section, and then end critical, C, C++, uh, hash pragma OMP critical, and then a C, C++ structured block. So that's, uh, you know, as usual, either a single statement or a set of statements enclosed in curly braces. So we can, there can be fairly straightforward use cases for this. So if you imagine you just have a, um, a shared variable which you want to add, add values to, then you can use a critical section for that. Um, though in practice, that, that kind of pattern is usually better dealt with um, using reductions. So you often have this choice um, in, in OpenMP and threaded programming in general, but in OpenMP in particular that supports, you know, has very good support for, for reduction operations, you often have this, this uh, choice to make, okay? So if you have um, the, this kind of pattern where you are um, making a, a simple update, like adding, adding into, a, into a shared variable, then you have the choice as to whether to handle that uh, by declaring it as a reduction variable, having every thread uh, accumulate a value in a, in a private copy, and then adding them all together at the end. Or you can use constructs like critical sections and, and atomics that will we'll come on to, 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 achieve this, to achieve the same effect. Um, so in the simple case of a uh, uh, a scalar variable and you just want every thread to add, say, add values to it, then um, for performance reasons, the reduction solution is usually better, um, but it's possible to do that in other ways as well. Um, here's a slightly more, so this example is meant to be something a little slightly more complicated and uh, uh, and and something that can't, you know, can't be handled, doesn't map onto a reduction pattern. So what I'm supposing here is that I have some data structure which behaves as a stack. So what does that mean? So it means essentially that um, it's used to store uh, values which correspond to computational tasks. So, uh, so it has. So I have two functions which I can call on the on the stack. I can call get next on the stack, which returns me a handle on some piece of work uh, to, that needs to be done. Uh, and then I can I can also call put new on that on the stack. Um, so if I have some new piece, if a thread generates a new piece of work to be done, then it can it can it can uh, put that onto the onto the stack. So, um, so I'm not showing any details of what that stack data structure looks like, um, but say so you know if uh, so doesn't really matter what it is, but it's you know it needs to be accessed by only one thread at a time, because if, uh, if two threads both try to get some new value off the stack at the same time, then the, you know, bad things might happen, like they might both get the same value, um, which, which, would not, which would be incorrect. Or for example, if one thread tried to put a new value onto the stack at the same time as another thread was, was getting a value from it, then uh, one, of, so, you know, one, of the, one of the pieces of work might get lost. Uh, because of the because of the race conditions that are happening. So how can I get around this? Well, this is, would be a, a, a classical case for for using critical critical sections. Um, so um, so what we do is that okay. So inside a parallel region, we have multiple threads executing. So we enclose the call to get next and the call to put new inside critical, OpenMP critical regions. Now, the semantics for critical, it means that 
not uh, own, it, you get mutual exclusion from all critical regions. So that means that not only can it's not only it not only prevents two threads from being in the first critical region at the same time, but it also prevents one thread being in the first critical region and a different thread being in the second critical region at the same time. Okay, so effectively, critical regions, all critical regions use the same underlying global lock to prevent um, mutual uh, access to that to that region by by multiple threads. Okay. So I'm going to move on now and talk about the atomic directive. So this is, so semantically, atomic directive is a special case of a critical section. Um, though semantics are slightly different, okay? Um, so what this does is you can use it to protect a single update to a shared variable. Um, so the restrictions are that it applies only to a single statement. Uh, and also it applies only to updates to basic types. So the reason for this will be, will be why, this is, uh, why this is useful uh, will, be, will hopefully become clear when, when we come to an example. Um, but let's, let's go through the syntax first. Um, so in Fortran, it's uh, exclamation dot, exclamation mark dollar OMP atomic, followed by a statement. Uh, and the statement must have the form of an update. So it must look like something uh, where like, X equals X operator some expression or the other way around, or we can use, um, you can be an update using in, uh, Fortran intrinsics. So the operators allowed here are say, are, uh, Addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, and some uh, the log some logical uh, operators as well. Okay. So again, so uh, addition and subtraction would be the would be the common cases here. Um, and you can also have intrinsics. So again, so maximum and minimum are the other common use cases. So if you have an if you have a an update that looks like x equals max of x and something some expression, then we can protect that kind of update with, um, with with critical sex with sorry atomics atomics. Okay, and C and C plus plus also have. Uh, same idea. Um, the, rest, the restrictions are slightly different, so um, the, well, list, the list of operators is 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 slightly different and appropriate for C and C plus plus. In this case, the statement must must be able to um, have a, a binary operator um, form, so uh, x plus equals something, or so the semantic shorthands like x plus plus or x minus minus. So how is this different from a critical section which just contains one statement? Well, in atomic, the evaluation of the expression is not protected. And so the only thing that's protected here is the update to the variable that's on the left-hand side. Um, so if evaluating the right-hand side expression uh, contained accesses to shared variables, um, then there is no mutual exclusion implied in the evaluation of the of the of the right hand side. The other reason why it can be 
more efficient is because there is this notion of something that's being updated. So uh, Atomic uh, has a clear uh, indication, so it has a clear meaning in the sense of it ident the, uh, the value that appears on the left-hand side of the statement is the memory address that's being updated. Um, so in which case, so the compiler therefore has, knows what it is you are using this construct to, to protect. Whereas in a, a, in a critical section, it could be anything and, and the compiler can't really tell what it is you're trying to protect. Whereas with Atomic, um, it's the restrictions mean that the compiler knows which memory location the update is happening to. Um, and that means it can be more efficient. Uh, both in terms that it can uh, use, uh, the compiler can generate special uh, instructions if those are available in the hardware. Um, and it can also uh, protect, do things like protect different array elements separately. Okay, so it's possible that um, uh, with using Atomic, if the, uh, if the value on the left-hand side happens to be an array element, then uh, the updates to different array elements can be done in parallel, uh, whereas that would not be the case with critical. And we'll see that in an example coming up. Okay. So um, the other thing to remember is that this does not interact with critical. So if you are in, in the same parallel region, you can't protect a, uh, an, uh, an update to a memory location with atomic in one place and critical somewhere else and hope to get mutual exclusion between those two. Okay. So critical mutually excludes with critical, atomic mutually excludes with atomic, um, but not across each other. Okay, so here's an example of, uh, of using Atomic and why this uh, hopefully illustrates why this is, can be beneficial and, and different from using critical. Okay. So what I'm imagining here is that I have a, a graph. So um, there's a small graph in the illustration on, on this slide. So graphs consist of vertices, which are the gray dots, and vertices are connected together with edges, which are the red lines. And the computation I want to do here is to compute the degree of every vertex. And the degree of every vertex is simply the number of edges that are connected to it. So for example, the, uh, the vertex on the far right here has three edges connected to it. So that, that vertex has degree three. Uh, the vertex at the bottom has one edge connected to it. So it has degree one. And the way I want to do this computation is to, uh, is to loop over all the edges and then, so for every edge, I, 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 know I have a record of which vertices it's connected to. So if I loop over the, all the edges, then I add one to the degree counts uh, for the vertices at either end. Okay, so that's what this piece, little piece of code does. Okay, so if you just ignore the OpenMP directives for the minute, so I have a loop for j equals zero, j less than number of edges. So that's the loop that, that goes all, all over the edges. Um, so, for F, so for edge j, um, I look up vertex one and use that index as an index into the degree, ar degree array. So the array of degrees uh, and add one to it. And, and then have another statement which looks up the vertex at the other end and again, uses that as an index into the degree array and, and add one to it. So you can imagine if I, um, if I tried to use a critical section to do this, 
then I could get the correct answer, but the critical section would contain everything that's in the loop. So I wouldn't get any parallelism at all. So if I have mutually, if I just have a single critical section which mutually excludes, then I just don't get I just don't get any parallelism at all. Uh, I'll get the correct answer because I'll have avoided any possible race conditions, where um, because it would be possible for the uh, for different values of j both to index the same element of the of the degree array. So there are possible race conditions here. It would be possible that two threads both try to update the same array element concurrently. But putting that inside a critical section would remove all the parallelism altogether. Uh, and in fact, it would add some overhead, so it would actually go slower than doing it on a single thread. Um, so that's no good. However, so I, my alternative here is to use atomic directives. So if I, because these are, I imagine that degrees are integers, so they are basic types. And so I can use, and I, my update consists of a single statement. So that allows me to use atomic to protect these updates. And what that means is that it gives the compiler the opportunity to realize uh, and do uh, allow concurrent updates to um, different array elements in parallel. So what you hope is that, yes, there's some small overhead associated with uh, having atomic accesses versus uh, regular old reads and writes, um, but that accesses to different array elements can, can happen concurrently. So formally, the OpenMP specification doesn't guarantee that the compiler does this. Um, but in practice, you will find that uh, most OpenMP implementations will do a pretty good job on this type of example or, of allowing concurrent updates with, with reasonably low overhead for doing the mutual exclusion. So the last synchronization mechanism we're going to look at uh, this afternoon are lock routines. Um, so um, uh, critical and atomic cover uh, a lot of the sort of classic synchronization patterns where we are doing updates to to shared variables. But sometimes you know, find ourselves with that, with algorithms that require more flexibility than that. It's not enough. Um, to do that. Um, uh, so, for example, if we have, you know, if we have arrays of, uh, instead of, uh, and we want to do updates to things which are not basic types, so if we have arrays of structures or arrays of objects, then we may not be able to, to um, and, and the update is, is, is a more complicated operation, we may not be able to, um, to use atomic uh, and using critical may not be a fit, may not using uh, critical, which is effectively a, a single global lock, uh, may not be the most efficient way to do things. Um, so sometimes the, neither neither critical nor atomic is is necessarily appropriate, uh, and we might require some more flexibility, uh, and that's provided uh, by lock routines. Um, so if you've used other threading models, so these are very classical uh, mutex locks. Um, so the way this works is that a lock is a special variable. Um, so uh, a thread is able to set a lock, uh, and that means that no other thread can then set that lock uh, until it's been unset by the thread that, that currently owns it. There are, uh, in OpenMP, uh, there are two routines for setting a lock. You can either do this in a blocking fashion, which is 
by far and away the most common use case. So a thread can try to set a lock uh, and that call will block and wait until the, the lock is available. Or you can also do it in a non-blocking way. You can say uh, a thread can attempt to set a lock and the routine will always return, but it will return uh, with a logical value which indicates whether, this, whether the set was successful or not. Um, so the non-blocking version is, is, much, um, is much less commonly used, but there are some algorithms where, where, it, where it's useful. So, um, you know, it, but it, you would kind of need to be in the situation where you know, a thread wants to, uh, wants to do some update, um, but if it can't do it right now, then, there's, then it has something else. There's some other useful work that it can go away and do in the meantime, and then it can come back again and, and, and maybe try later to do the update. So non-blocking uh, lock, non sets can be useful in that kind of situation, but uh, that, that's fairly uncommon. So an OpenMP uh, lock must be initialized before it's used, uh, and then you can destroy it when it's no longer required, um, which uh, potentially frees up some, some memory resources associated with it. Uh, and lock variable, you're supposed not to use, they're supposed to be opaque things, opaque objects. So um, although they're probably implemented as some, some basic integer type, um, you're not supposed to store values in, in uh, in lock variables. Okay, so um, the lock routines are part of the OpenMP runtime library, um, and so there are uh, there are there are five routines here. So the first one is OMP init lock, which does the initialization. The second one is OMP set lock, which is the blocking set. Slightly confusingly, the non-blocking set is called test lock, which I think was a slightly poor choice of naming convention. So OMP test lock. Um, doesn't just test whether the lock is set or not. It, it, it tries to set it and then returns true or false depending on, on whether it succeeded or not. Then we have the unset, uh, and then finally the, 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 the destroy that we can call when, we've, when we're done with the lock. So um, for Fortran, um, yeah, so, and you can you can ignore this stuff about getting integers at the right size. Um, so in, in modern Fortran, you just use by uh, the OMP lib module defines an OMP lock kind that you can use to declare these the lock variables. And then similarly for C C plus plus, so we have. Uh, Exactly the analogous set of routines, init, set, test, unset, and destroy. Uh, and again, the OMP header file um, defines an OMP lock T, OMP lock -t type, um, which you can use to, to type these things correctly. Okay. So, see how we could use locks to solve my graph problem again. Um, so, same problem, computing the degree of every vertex in a graph. So, what I'm going to do here, so instead of using atomics, uh, I'm going to use the locks. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a array of locks. So, and I'm going to have one, exactly one lock per vertex here. Okay. Um, so that's just my choice. I don't have to do it like this, but that's, um, this is a, a straightforward implementation. So 
what I can uh, what I can do is so I have so I'm going to uh, declare an array of of locks uh, uh, so where I have exactly one lock per verti vertex and then my first loop here um, does does the initialization and then, so instead of using the atomic directives, what I can do is every time I want to update, so you can maybe see my, hopefully maybe see my pointer here. Every time I want to uh, update uh, an element of this degree array, then what I do is I set the matching lock in the lock array. Okay, so I use the same expression to index the lock array as I as I want to use to index the degree array. Okay. So there's no um, you know, there's no semantic connection between the locks and the data that I'm that that I'm using them to protect. Okay, that's entirely a construct of the program here. Um, so you know I I and I I could do it differently. Okay, so I could use you know. I could use one lock to protect 100 elements of the degree array, for example. Okay, um, and then my, you know, my the the way I index the lock array would be different. Um, so you know, that that's entirely up to, up 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 to us as programmers as to how we use them. Um, so so what I do is every time I want to update an element of the degree array, I lock the corresponding lock variable, do the update. And then unset it again, okay. and then the same same pattern again for the for the update to the to the uh, the uh, degree element for the for the other vertex. So th this is um, this achieves the same thing. It probably has an uh, most likely has a higher overhead than using atomics, um, but it's more flexible in the sense that I now you know. Um, it's now possible to have any arbitrary code between the set and the unset here. So I can do, you know, I can have more complicated update functions than, uh, than I can with, with, with plain old atomic directives. Okay. So um, I've described this problem in terms of in terms of graphs with edges and vertices um, but in uh, in some some fields in scientific computing this is actually a really common pattern uh, if uh, for anything that's in, in, typically for anything that involves n body simulations because you can imagine instead of instead of um, having vertices and edges if I have particles, and wherever I have an edge in the graph, I have an interaction, uh, a force interaction between particles. Then typically, what I need to do is, uh, you know, is compute the force interaction between a pair of particles, uh, and then update the the total force on each particle uh, on on either end of the interaction. So this this does turn out to be a, a, a quite a quite a common pattern. For uh, for if in in n body simulations, and so the um, the particles may be um, objects or structures, so it might not be appropriate to use atomic directives. Um, and then what you again is so with that with that kind of uh, with that kind of code, what you could do is you could. Um, have a you could declare a lock variable as a member of the particle structure or particle object, so that every particle has has its own lock. So whenever you want to update one of the fields that belongs to a particle, you set its lock, do the update, and, and unset it. So that's uh, that would be quite a uh, that that's a reasonably common pattern. Okay, um, and so that's what uh, that's what the example is given uh, for the uh, practical for that relates to this session for. So it's a very simple molecular dynamics example. Um, it 
doesn't do anything particularly clever. It, uh, it's, uh, it basically considers you know, all particle pairs, uh, though it does have a, a cutoff radius. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, a fairly, it's a fairly naive end body algorithm, but it, uh, it illustrates the point uh, in the sense that you, you, you have these uh, uh, pairwise interactions uh, and then you need to update the, uh, the, uh, the accumulated force on, on either end. Okay. So, um, so the idea here is that, uh, yeah, the, the, this computation is completely dominated. It spends almost all its time in this calculation of the wise forces. Um, so you can parallelize this routine with a, with a loop directive uh, and critical sections to begin with. So that's the um, uh, that's the simplest approach, and then you can try using the different mechanisms. So you can solve. So uh, you can test the performance with critical sections, and you will probably find that you know, um, after a, after beyond a small number of threads, then the critical section becomes a a significant bottleneck, uh, and you get no more speed up. In fact, you'll probably see slow down. Eventually, if you add more, if you add too many threads, it'll start the uh, the code will start going slower again. So you'll see that uh, uh, that a, that a critical section is will will give you the right answer here, but uh, won't necessarily perform very well. Um, so you can try other mechanisms. So you can try you can try using locks. You can try using atomics. Um, um, but this is uh, this is actually also one of these cases where you have this uh, alternative approach is that's that's to use uh, to use reductions so in this case you would need to use an array reduction because you have basically this is uh, this is implemented as the um, the forces are are, are implemented as as, a, as an array um, so you can you can also use a, an, an, a, a, a reduction clause with an an, an array, using a, a, an addition operator with the with an array um, to solve this problem as well. So you can test and see whether it's uh, with with this kind of you know with scalars. Then it's almost certain that the um, reduction will be faster. When you have arrays, it's a lot less clear because um, it depends on how frequently there might be. Uh, colliding interactions um, so that uh, so with a re with a array reductions it's it's never completely obvious whether um, sort of the locking or atomic type strategy is better than the array reduction strategy it depends on the um, depends on the use case but anyway you can you, this this example allows you to to uh, to experiment with all with all the different options on uh, on the same code and uh, and see what happens. Okay, great. So that's the end of my slides for this session. And does anybody have any questions? Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions on that uh, on on this topic. So let's uh, let's take a break and we'll resume again at, uh, at half past the hour. Okay, great. So welcome back, everybody. Um, so second session this afternoon is uh, is a collection of, of, of additional topics which don't really quite relate to each other and uh, aren't worth a full session in their whole right, but they are um, all useful things to know about. So the things I'm going to cover here are nested parallelism, orphaned constructs, um, thread private global variables, and then finally a, a word about timing routines. So start off with, with nested parallelism. Um, so nested parallelism is supported in OpenMP uh, in the sense that uh, if we're already inside a parallel region and a thread encounters another parallel directive, then that will create a new team of threads. So um, 
typically in most implementations, this is disabled by default. So you need to enable it by either uh, setting the OMP nested environment variable to true or by calling the OMP set nested routine. Um, if nested parameters are disabled, then what will happen is the code will still execute, but the inner teams will only ever contain one thread. So what will happen if uh, so you have a thread inside a parallel region, it sees another parallel directive, um, so it logically creates a new parallel region, but it doesn't create any additional threads. It then becomes the master thread of that new parallel region and effectively executes it sequentially. Um, so say the, the code still will still execute, but you just don't work, if you don't enable nested parallelism, then you will not create any additional threads than existed at the top level parallel region. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means you can uh, you can potentially code things like this. Okay, so let's suppose that I have um, two loops here. So I have uh, I have one loop here, which is uh, an I, the I loop, and I have a second loop here, which is the J loop. And so not only are both these loops parallel in themselves, but they are also independent of each other. Because first, the I loop uh, calculates an, uh, an array X, and the J loop calculates an, an, an array Y. And those, you know, those, that's separate storage. So, so not only do I have parallelism within the loop, but I have parallelism, potential parallelism between the loops as well. Okay. So, what I could do is I could, uh, you know, I could say, okay. Um, so, suppose I have um, a machine with eight cores. Then, potentially, what I can do is I can have uh, the loop split across four threads running on half the cores and the J loop also split across four threads running on the other half of the cores uh, and those two loops executing at the same time. So how would I do that? Okay, so uh, well, I'd start an outer parallel region uh, and then I would just make have a simple switch based on the on the thread ID Say so, okay, if I'm thread zero, then create a new parallel region. Okay, so this is remember this is the combined parallel and loop sharing direct loop uh, work sharing directive here. So this both creates a new team of threads and shares out the loop iterations across them. So I could arrange for uh, so through final thread zero create a new team of threads to execute the I loop in parallel. Otherwise, if I'm thread one at the outer level, create another new team of threads to execute the J loop in parallel as well. Okay, so I'd end up with something like this. So I have my, my original master thread. It encounters the first parallel region. Uh, so it creates an, uh, one extra thread and then each of those to now two existing threads, uh, and then go and create a team of, in total, four threads on this side, four threads on this side, so eight threads in total executing concurrently, half of them executing the I loop, half of them executing the J loop, and then concurrently. So it's entirely possible to, to do this, to do that kind of thing. So um, it's not often needed, uh, but it can be useful if you have um, multiple levels of parallelism application, but the outer level doesn't contain enough parallelism to keep all your potential threads busy. Okay, so um, yeah, 
So nested parallelism yeah, is actually pretty widely supported in most implementations these days. So I, I think you can probably ignore uh, this, concept. but it's um, the sort of corollary is 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 still important. Um, they're enabling nested parallelism does incur some additional overheads in the runtime implementation. So um, that's the reason that most implementations disable it by default. Uh, and so the, so the message here is don't enable nested parallelism unless you're actually intending to use it because it does make single, you know, having it enabled makes single level parallelism more expensive to do. Okay, so what I glossed over in that example is how to control the number of threads that you get at each level of, of parallelism. Um, so there's a number of different ways of doing this. Um, simplest way is, to, is just to use the environment variable because the environment variable will actually accept a comma separated list of values which, which uh, um, determines how many threads will be used at each level of nesting. So for the example I just gave, I could say export OMP num threads equals two core, and that will ensure that I get two threads at the outer level and four threads for each of the inner teams um, as I wanted in, in the example that I showed there. There are other ways. So you can also use the OMP set num threads routine, or you can use the num threads clause on the parallel region. Um, and that gives you potentially more control because you might be in a situation where you don't want the same num threads for all of the inner teams. Hmm. So you can potentially do stuff uh, that's a little bit more messy and complicated like this. So you can use the, the OMP set num threads uh, function. What it does is it essentially, uh, it determines for the thread that calls the routine, how many threads that thread will then generate if it subsequently encounters the parallel region. So I can achieve the same kind of thing by saying, okay, um, in the master thread, call OMP set num threads two. So when the master thread encounters a parallel directive, um, as I say in this case, again, it's one of these combined parallel region and work sharing directives, it will then create two threads. And then in this case, so I might do something complicated. So for every iteration of the parallel loop, and there might be more iterations than I have threads, I can potentially set a different number of threads. I can call OMP set num threads again and, uh, you know, then, and return some function or look up in, some, in, look up in an array how many threads I want for that particular, for that particular value of i, I can choose a different number of threads to execute this particular instance of this inner parallel region. So you can have as much flexibility as you like uh, creating teams of different sizes. So by calling OMP set num threads, that overrides any values that you set in the uh, in environment variable. And there's also yet another way to do this. Um, you can also specify a num threads clause on the parallel region itself. Um, and that in turn overrides anything that you set either in the environment variable or by previous calls to OMP set num threads. Um, so there's actually multiple ways of controlling the number of threads that you get for every instance of, of every parallel region at every level of nesting. So there's also more control that you can exert because um, 
if you use nested parallelism without being care too careful about uh, the number of threads, then you can very easily end up oversubscribing your hardware resources. Uh, you can end up generating more threads than you have cores or hardware threads available. Um, so you can also set a limit um, uh, by so you can control the maximum number of threads running at any one time. So you can set this environment variable OMP thread limit. Uh, and so typically what you would do is you would match that to your hardware resources. So you might say, okay, I've got 64 cores in my system, so I will, I will limit the number of threads running at any one time to be 64. So again, what will happen uh, in the code uh, if, that, if that limit's already been reached then, uh, and a thread encounters a parallel region, it will just go ahead and execute it itself. It won't create any additional threads. So again, the, the code keeps working, um, but you don't you don't create any more threads to uh, to execute parallel regions. They just get executed sequentially by the thread that uh, that encountered them. Um, and you can also control the maximum depth of nesting as well. So there's another environment variable, OMP max active levels, uh, and also a, a matching. Um, Runtime library call uh, to to control to set the number of act to control the number of active levels, and again, um, if you exceed that number of levels, you just get one thread executing the parallel regions that are encountered. Okay. Uh, and then there's a bunch of utility routines for figuring out, uh, you know, which level am I executing at? Which, uh, you know, what's 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 the thread number at my ancestor of my ancestor threads and all this kind of thing. Okay. So OMP get level returns the level of parallelism of the calling thread. So that's zero in the sequential parts of the program. So uh, and then in the top level it's one and then the, and so on. Um, get active level does much the same, um, but it, it, this ignores levels which are in which are called inactive, uh, which are basically uh, if if a parallel region is executed by a team that only contains one thread, then then that does then that's not counted. You can then get your uh, the ID of your ancestor thread at any level above you. Um, so, because uh, OMP get thread num, so the usual call always refers to the innermost enclosing parallel region. So, if you want a thread number of the of not this parallel region, but the the one that's outside that created this one, then then you can call get ancestor thread num. So, for example, if I want my, uh, if I want the idea of my parent thread, then I can uh, ask, okay, what level am I at? Subtract one, and then get my get the thread number from that level. So that will give you your the ID of your your parent thread in the in the nest of parallel regions. Uh, and likewise, you can also get the team size. Say how how many threads are there. Uh, how many threads were created at at, at higher levels of in the, in the, in the nest? Okay. So I say that's uh, there's there's quite a lot of support for nested parallelism. Not a huge number of applications use it. Uh, I would say in practice, um, but it. It can be useful, and it's um, it's useful to uh, that it works to be able to support um, library codes, um, because if you want a um, uh, if you want a multi-threaded library that will also you know so you can call it in 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 different modes, where so you can call it both from 
a single thread or you can call it from multiple threads inside a parallel region uh, and then have also have parallel execution or sequential execution inside the library depending on what you want then um, using using all this makes it uh, makes it possible to, to deal with that so if you're implementing a multi-threaded library then which could potentially be called from a user's OpenMP program then um, all this support for nested parallelism is, is, is useful and helpful There's one particular use case which uh, you might think of um, as, a, as, as, a, as a good candidate for um, using nested parallelism, uh, but actually has a lighter weight implementation mechanism uh, instead. Because okay, there's, there's a reasonable overhead, occur, uh, you know, every time you create a team of threads, there's some there's some additional overhead in the runtime, so it's a relatively expensive operation, um, and there's this common use case of so-called perfectly nested rectangular loops, um, which has a, um, a basically a way of doing uh, of doing of handling them without using nested nested teams. So uh, this is the collapse clause. So um, let me first explain what perfectly nested rectangular loops are. Okay. So uh, so here's here's an example. So this is a nest of two loops. Okay. So that's you know where you have uh, loops inside each other. That's nested loops. They are, these ones are rectangular, so the iteration space is rectangular because the bounds of the inner loops do not depend on the iterators of outer loops. So in, in this case, for example, if I had, instead of j less than m here, if I had j less than i, that would not be a rectangular loop. So as long as so so the loop bounds of the inner loops have to be independent of the values of the iterators in outer loops. The perfect bit means that there is no code in between the loops. So all the executable statements in the nest appear inside the innermost loop. Okay. Um, so it's a it's a restricted case, but it's a it's a fairly common case. And in this case, if we want to parallelize more than one loop in the nest, we can use the collapse clause. So this is a clause on the uh, work sharing loop directive. So it belongs to the OMP4 or in Fortran OMP2 directive. Uh, it takes an argument which says how many loops you want to collapse and execute in parallel. So what this will do is it will transform, the compiler will transform this code into a single loop. Okay, In this case, it will be of length n times m. So it will collapse the i and the j loops into a single long loop of length n times n. And then it'll then treat that as the parallel as the parallel loop. And the uh, if you have a schedule clause on that, and the schedule clause has a chunk size, for example, then the scheduling clause is applied to that long generated loop. So the chunk size refers to the iterations of the of the of the long loop. Um, so when is this useful? Huh? So typically, what you what you this, this is used with. Um, so suppose the value of n is you know sim is roughly the same as so maybe slightly less than or slightly more than the number of threads that you have. So just parallelizing the outer loop on the on its own may not have good load load balance. Uh, so you know, so think of the case where n is slightly larger than the number of threads, 
So if you just parallelize the outer loop, that would mean that some threads get one I value, other threads get two I values. Um, so the load balance would be poor. And some threads have twice as much work to do as, as others. Um, so this essentially is creating um, more loop iterations, which can be more evenly balanced out. Um, so if n times m is, is significantly bigger than the number of threads, then the, uh, the remainders won't have such a nasty effect. Um, and you'll get a get better load balance like by, by using this. So for this particular use case, using the collapse clause will be, uh, say it's a restricted case, but uh, that'll be almost certainly more efficient than handling it using nested teams. So you could have, you could also handle this case using uh, using nested parallelism, um, but it but it wouldn't be as effective. Okay, so next subtopic for this talk is orphaned directives, and so. This is just really to say that um, directives that appear inside parallel regions don't have to lexically appear in the same source, in the same function or same source file as the parallel region. Um, so in other words, what it means is that you can have, uh, you can have function calls uh, inside parallel region, so function of subroutine calls inside a parallel region. Uh, and then you can have other directives like work sharing directives or synchronization directives like critical and atomic or barriers or whatever. Uh, they, those can, it's perfectly okay for those to appear inside the called functions rather than directly inside the, the parallel region. Um, so that all works fine. Um, because that you know that allows you to maintain your your code structure and your modular programming style with, without having to without having to change anything. You don't have to manually inline line routines or anything like that. Um, can be a little bit complicated. So if I go back to that previous example, you know, so what would happen if uh, you have to think? You know, what would happen if uh, subroutine Fred was also called from outside the parallel region in the master thread. And uh, the answer is everything's okay. Um, if you have a work sharing directive called uh, in, just called directly from the master thread without a parallel region, then the master thread will just execute the, the loop sequentially. So that, that all works out fine. The complicated thing is what happens to variables. So the data, scope, data scoping attributes get, get a little bit more complicated. Okay. So what happens, uh, so we've now got potentially different types of different places where variables might be declared, um, which might not be in scope at the par where the parallel region appears. So are those things shared or private? So there's some various rules that apply here, um, but um, uh, th these are the main ones that tell you what happens. So what happens, if we call a subroutine from inside a parallel region, then variables in the argument list, so things we pass through the argument list, inherit their data attributes scope from the calling routine. Okay. Um, so if, uh, so if a variable is, is private in a parallel region, we pass it into a routine, it's private inside. If it's shared at parallel region, we pass it in, it's, it's shared inside. If the routine accesses global variables, then, um, so that's, you know, that's file scope or namespace scope variables in C and C++, um, or common blocks or module variables in Fortran, those things are shared uh, unless they are 
specifically declared thread private, which I'll, I'll come back to later on. So by default, global variables are all shared. Um, what about local variables that are declared inside the routine? Well, if they have the static keyword in CRC++ or the save attribute in Fortran, and then those are shared, but all other local variables uh, are private to the thread. So um, that might seem a little bit arbitrary and mysterious, but the, uh, the underlying reasons here are essentially the, the, it, whether things are uh, default to being shared or private depends whether they're allocated on the heap or, or allocated on the stack. So essentially, um, every thread has its own stack. So stack allocated variables, which is, uh, which is how, this is what happens to, to local variables inside a routine will be allocated on the stack. Then every thread has its own stack. So every thread gets a private copy of those things. Things which will be naturally, like, naturally allocated on the heap, so things like global variables, um, they are, there's, there only is one heap. All threads have access to the same heap. So those things are, are, are naturally shared, shared by default. So, I, I promised I would talk a bit about thread private global variables. Um, thread private global variables are not a nice thing. Okay? They are they are pretty ugly, and you if you are if you have the luxury of designing a code from, from scratch, um, then you should really try to avoid this. However, it's a useful feature if you're trying to retrofit OpenMP into an existing sequential code that makes use of global variables. Um, because uh, re refactoring the code to pass everything down, uh, pass everything through to, you know, to make copies and make private copies and um, pass things down through argument lists and so on um, may be really difficult. Um, so this is really a, uh, you know, a software engineering convenience to avoid large-scale refactoring of, of existing codes, um, but you should not, uh, you should not really design codes to use this. So yeah, so for uh, you know, for software engineering convenience, you you may wish to have to get each thread to have its own copy of, of variables with, with global scope. Um, and you know, if you're, when you're outside parallel region and in, the mas and in master directives, accesses to those variables refer to the master threads copy. Okay. So as you might expect, every thread gets a copy. But if you're outside of a parallel region, then um, then you refer, then it always refers to the master threads copy of those things. So how did this, this works? Well, basically you have to add the thread private uh, directive with a list of variables um, and this has to appear wherever you declare those things. So that's also a bit ugly because that can be multiple different places. So in Fortran, uh, thread private directive, uh, so the list can, um, so that probably, unless you're unfortunate enough to use very old fashioned code, you probably don't have to care about comma blocks these days, but module variables or saved variables appear in the list. Uh, and that directive has to come after all the declarations for those, for those blocks or variables. C of C++, okay, same, same directive essentially. Uh, the directive must be at the file or namespace scope, um, and it has to appear after all the declarations of things in the list uh, and before any uses of them in, in executable code. And there are some other, res other restrictions, which, I, which I, I won't go into in, in detail here. 
There's also a copy in clause on the parallel region, which allows, what, which uh, automatically copies the value of the master threads, thread private variables into, into those of all the other threads at the start of the parallel region. So as I say, that's um, it's a it's a uh, sometimes a useful a useful and necessary convenience, but it's uh, it's it's not a particularly nice feature. And there are there are some rules about when uh, when you can rely on the values of thread private global variables persisting between different parallel regions. Okay, so my final topic for today is just to mention the timing routines. Um, so OpenMP supports a, a portable timing routine. Um, so this is OMP get w, get w time. Um, so this returns the current war clock time relative to some arbitrary origin. Uh, and its value is a double in, in seconds. Um, you can also inquire what the precision of the clock in a particular implementation is. So OMP get w tick tells you, essentially says, this is the smallest interval that, uh, that the clock can be incremented by. Um, in practice, this is usually pretty small in most, most implementations. It's you know, no bigger than a microsecond uh, and possibly small, possibly less than a microsecond. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's most implementations have a pretty high precision clock here, um, so it's um, it's 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 very convenient and it's you know it's portable, so you're not right you're not using uh, clock routines which are operating system specific or um, or have not or have nasty interfaces where you have to do some horrible conversion to get to get something that you can actually print out sensibly. So the way we'd use is, you know, is is the typical thing. You have a, a block of code you want to you want to measure the execution time for. Um, uh, so yeah, you call the call OMP get W time, store the value, execute the block of code. Uh, and then call it again and, and, and take the difference from the first value. Um, timers are, um, at least in principle, local to a thread. So you, so both the calls should be on the on the same thread uh, to, to guarantee that you you get the right answer here. Okay. So there so there aren't any guarantees about the resolution, but most implementations are pretty good, uh, and also the uh, the routine tends to have pretty low overhead so it is it is possible to to accurately time really quite quite short sections of code with this um, and this is um, this is definitely useful for for performance analysis and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in the final session next week okay um, so Based on some of the stuff I've just talked about, what you can do uh, in the um, with the practical examples is to take the molecular dynamics example and see how that works with orphan directives. So instead of having the parallel region uh, inside the forces routine, what you can do is lift the parallel region out into the calling routine. Uh, but keep the work sharing loop directive inside the routine and uh, make everything else inside the uh, inside the outer time stepping loop sequential and so that's um, so you might want to use um, master or single to do that and uh, you can see how all that see how all that works um, this particular example, you won't see any um, performance gain from it, but you will see that it makes the, uh, uh, because you get uh, a whole bunch of private variables essentially for free, 
it, it means that your private and shared clauses become uh, a lot less, uh, a lot more compact potentially by doing this. So you can uh, you can see how the orphaning works and and how the uh, how the data scoping uh, rules, how some of the data scoping rules work for you um, to make to make the code uh, easier to a bit easier to read. Um, okay, so that's all I had for for this session. Um, is there any are there any questions about that? Okay, so question: um, this, Does the collapse clause perform some optimization of the order execution of the iterations, like loop tiling? Um, no, it doesn't. Is uh, is is the answer. Uh, so it uh, it execute the way it uh, what it does is it just simply generates the um, the loop that would give you the equivalent order uh, of sequential execution. Um, so uh, uh, potentially your compiler may try also try to do some tiling, um, but that's uh, that's up to that's up to the compiler optimization. So the compiler optimization may still try to do stuff, um, but the uh, the collapse clause itself does not net, does not imply any, any any such any such optimization. But the way it parallelizes is it, it generates the loop that gives you the sequentially equivalent order of execution uh, and then uh, applies the scheduling clause or the default scheduling policy to that generated loop. So that's so it's it is deterministic in the sense of which um, you know, which threads will get which ex, which uh, which iterations of the of the collapsed loop. Um, but you know, it doesn't necessarily um, imply any other optimizations. Okay, so next week will be our last session. So I'll be covering uh, no more new syntax, um, but a, uh, a couple of what I hope are, are, are really useful sessions. So there's one on um, essentially, uh, which I, I call tips, tricks, and gotchas. So these these are all the things that I've you know, various different um, little things that you can do or, uh, or or look out for when you're writing OpenMP programs. So this is sort of collected from many years of experience of. Um, of you know of watching beginners start out with OpenMP and you know, the, the the typical uh, typical mistakes that are easy to make and some of the typical things that you can do to to make your make your life easier. Um, uh, so that's the first that will be the one session next week and then the other section the other session is um, I'll I'll be talking about performance issues because you know, it's um, you know it's reasonably easy. To uh, in general, to you know, to write OpenMP programs that, that give you the right answers, um, but you know, optimizing them for performance is uh, is at least as difficult. So um, I'll try and give you some uh, uh, at least uh, you know a framework for how to how to reason about performance issues and uh, and think about how to how to diagnose them and, and, and solve them. Uh, so again, just to remind you, if you think of any questions in the meantime, or you have any, uh, you know, anything comes up from, from running the practical sessions on our machines, then um, please use the, uh, the course chat page. Um, I'll do my best to answer any questions on there. And um, so if there's no more questions, uh, thank you very much for your uh, your your attention today, and I'll hopefully speak to you all again next week. <laughs>